Here's exactly how the world's wealthiest people invest. There are two reports, so one from Vanguard and one from Bank of America that break down exactly how affluent and ultra high net worth households invest their money. By diving into their strategies, we can learn how to do the same, how things differ from the rich to the ultra rich, and also avoid any of the mistakes that they might make. So let's actually start with the first report. This Vanguard study looked at 800,000 affluent households with account balances of more than half a million and a median balance of $1 million. And there are three main takeaways that I found through combing through the information. First, let's talk about asset allocation. Now, asset allocation, if you don't know what that is, it's basically the practice of figuring out how much of a proportion of stocks versus bonds versus cash that you're gonna have in your portfolio. It's the first thing that we should be doing when we are trying to figure out how to invest. And so to do it simply, you wanna ask yourself kind of some simple questions. Number one, what are your financial goals? Number two, what is your risk tolerance? And number three, what is your time horizon? and how long do you wanna be investing for? There are plenty of online questionnaires that you can fill out that kind of guide you in this asset allocation discovery process, and I will link some down below so that you can reference them after this video. All right, so let's now go to the findings of this study. The study found that the average allocation to stocks, bonds, and cash was 64% in stocks, AKA equities, 23% in bonds, and 13% in cash. Basically, all of these affluent households have a long-term risk-taking strategy where they're trying to invest more in equities to grow their wealth. Now, this particular chart right here is skewed more towards the older folks as it does state that younger investors held about 90% of their portfolio in stocks. You can now see by this chart that the median equity allocation of anyone less than 45 years old was 84%, and that does decline to around 60% by the time they are ready to retire. So that's the first takeaway of asset allocation. It seems like the wealthy seem to still be skewed more towards equities. And then as they get older, they kind of de-risk a bit and try to go into more fixed income. The second most important finding of this report was actually that affluent investors favor, quote, a mix of active and passive portfolios with 75% of households holding a combination of both. And on average, those households have 43% of their portfolios allocated to active strategies. Now this was pretty fascinating to me because because usually on this channel, we don't talk about active managers or basically active mutual funds as an actual investment because most of them don't outperform the market. There's actually even been a new report saying that 80% of active fund managers are falling behind the index, according to the New York Times, that quote, studies have found that most actively managed mutual funds do worse than their benchmark index, both over the long run and in the vast majority of calendar years in the United States and elsewhere around the globe. The idea is that if the active fund manager isn't beating the index, they are also charging you close to a 1% expense ratio on your total investment. So sometimes active funds just aren't very good. Usually it just makes sense to invest in a low cost passive index ETF that tracks the market because the fees for those low cost ETFs and index funds are usually less than 0.1% per year. So for example, Vanguard's S&P 500 ETF VOO has an expense ratio of 0.03% per year, which is only $3 of a fee for every $10,000 you have invested. All right. So that kind of doesn't make sense to me. Why are so many affluent households still going with an active fund manager? Well, according to this Warden report, this is what they said. Many active investors who prefer active management understand the corrosive effect of higher expenses and know that managed funds as a group do poorly over the long term. But many bet that they can select the fund managers who are better than average. Now, some of it just has to do with psychological reasons, but I also think another reason is that because of the prevalence of social media with YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, etc., a lot more people are finding out about the low cost passive index fund strategy. A lot of the older generation that has money right now, they're still comfortable with their financial advisors. And a lot of the financial advisors will still recommend an actively managed mutual fund. I think that if we were to do this study in let's say 50 years, I'm really interested to see how the trends will have changed. Speaking of some good decisions that you can make at home, right now Webull is giving away between six to 12 free stocks whenever you sign up and make any deposit. It's one of the best promotions out there on the market right now by any stock brokerage app and I will leave a link down below in the description if you would like to check that out after the video. It does help support the channel whenever you guys use one of my links. So I do appreciate that in advance if you are doing that. Now, if you don't wanna do that, totally cool, no pressure at all. All right, the third takeaway of the Vanguard study was that affluent households for the most part prefer domestic equities versus international equities at an 81 to 19% ratio. The same thing happened with bonds as well with most people having an asset allocation of 81% domestic bonds versus 19% international bonds. 
accounts. If you've watched my portfolio videos on the three fund portfolio, you'll notice that usually we have a four to one proportion of domestic stocks to international stocks. And the reason for that is that the S&P 500 uh, domestically is one of the best stock markets in the world and it averages about eight to 10% per year. So 80-20, which is 80% domestic versus 20% international is usually the right mix of stocks. And that's what you kind of see being reflected in this study with affluent households. All right, let's move on to the Bank of America study, which looked at the wealthiest individuals in the United States. So how do their asset allocations differ from just the affluent household group? Right now, I want you guys to leave me a comment. Do you guys think it's different? Do you think it's similar? Or do you think it's gonna be completely off the rails? All right, so in this study, they were able to get 1,052 respondents with a household investable assets of over $3 million that were over the age of 21 at the end of 2022. If you're wondering like me, how someone who is the age of 21 has over $3 million in investable assets, it's primarily due to legacy wealth, AKA their parents probably gave it to them or they inherited that wealth. Now, I thought this was super interesting. Most wealthy individuals are baby boomers. Now that makes sense. The older you are, the more wealth that you accumulate over time. 27% of these people are self-made. So chances are that if you have over $3 million in investable assets as of last year, you probably got some assistance. Only one in four people then become self-made and get to above $3 million in investable assets. In terms of their asset allocation, people that were over the age of 43 had at least 55% of their portfolio in stocks. Younger people, on the other hand, only had 25% of their assets in stocks. So it seems that when younger people come from wealth, it seems like they're less confident in equities. Quote, 75% of younger people agree that it's no longer possible to achieve above average returns on traditional stocks and bonds alone. In comparison, only a third of the older group showed the same skepticism. I'll show you why shortly in this video, why younger people shouldn't be so skeptical, so stay tuned. The other cool stat that I think we should pay attention to here is that the wealthy people who are self-made, 57% of their allocation was towards stocks. So stocks is still a really great way to build your wealth. The younger people, what did they actually want to invest in? So a lot of them preferred alternative assets such as cryptocurrency. 29% of young people said crypto is a leading opportunity for growth compared to the 7% of the older bucket. Now the one asset that both of the buckets could agree on was actually real estate that had very similar response rates for that asset class. In terms of overall asset allocation, let's look at this bar graph. It actually showcases high net worth individuals and you can see that they usually have 28% domestic stocks, 15% international, 33% is in fixed income and 22% are in alternatives with 2% in cash. That if you remember is going to be quite different than what the affluent households had in the first study. I'm gonna pull up right now so that we can look at the differences. The affluent households have a mix of around 72% in equities and 28% in bonds, but high net worth individuals have 43% in equities and 33% in bonds. And the remaining difference is in alternative investments. So it seems that when you get richer and get wealthier, alternative assets become an option for you. And alternative assets include things like investing in hedge funds, private equity, and also private credit. Now, this is actually from another study. However, you can see that in terms of volatility percentage, the high net worth person goes for something a little less volatile, which means that they're more focused on preserving their money or capital preservation. This makes a lot of sense. The richer that you become, the more focused you are on not losing that wealth. You're just trying to make little gains consistently year over year over year because your base capital that you have is so large already. All right, so with all this fascinating data, should we, the average investor, be investing in alternatives and do we even have access to them? I was actually able to talk to an expert. He's one of my good friends, but wanted to remain anonymous. And he actually is a principal at a very big private equity firm. And when I asked him the question of, should the average retail investor try to get into alternative assets? This is what he said. These are actual text receipts. So he says, quote, in general, the more complicated the strategy, the less appropriate for an individual investor. Now I'm going to leave the second text up here. You can pause it if you'd like to read the full thing, but he says that hedge funds, because of their short-term taxable gains, makes it hard to compound your wealth and that hedge funds generate lower returns than indexing after considering taxes and fees. He goes on to say that private equity isn't attainable by average investors anyway, and that the only individual investors who are able to invest in alternatives have usually a $20 million net worth or are employees of those alternative firms. Private equity has a structure that makes 
less sense for individuals and that the average person is not gonna build their wealth by investing in private equity or hedge funds. So feel free to pause the video right now if you'd like to read his entire text exchange with me. So alternative investments are usually out of the question for us as the taxable investor, which means that we pay taxes on our investments. Usually high net worth individuals have access to institutional funds or endowment funds that usually they can tax defer or take tax advantages on their investments for quite some time. And it really would start to make sense with these alternative investments. So the real question is then how, as the average individual investor, how do we become wealthy so that we can maybe get access to these in the future? It starts by building income through your own job or other businesses, and then basically increasing your asset exposure. You wanna acquire assets like equities, real estate, other businesses, or you might even wanna push for more equity in the company that you work for by asking for more responsibility and gaining promotions. The idea is that you wanna be building your wealth in a way where your time is not tied to exactly how much you make. So you wanna basically break this relationship between your time and the money that you make. Once you have that wealth, or if you're on your way to building that wealth, one method in which you can preserve and grow your wealth is through equity. In this infamous blog post by Of Dollars and Data, which is a great financial blog, by the way, I'll link it down below as well. He gives a strong argument as to why the retail investor should, as the title of the blog suggests, just keep buying. His main point is that, quote, rather than worry about whether now is the right time to buy, just keep buying. Market high or market low, just keep buying. Now take a look at this graph here. He does point out that as stocks get more expensive and he uses the PE ratio to gauge whether or not a stock is expensive, their future returns generally decrease. Now this makes sense because if you buy an overvalued stock, it probably won't return as high as if you got in with a margin of safety. You can see here that as the PE ratio increases, there's a negative correlation here with your returns for at least the next five years. There are more red dots in the 30 to 40 PE range than in the 10 to 20 range. So red represents a negative return. Now here's the fascinating part. The author Nick says that as long as you hold for a longer period of time, you wanna see actually what happens to your real returns, even if you bought them at an overvalued price. Looking at this interactive GIF, GIF, graphic, whatever you wanna call it, you can see that as the years pass by, your five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, etc. the number of red dots decreases and starts to converge over time. He states that over any 20 year period, US stocks have had no real negative returns when including dividends. And over a 30 year period, the returns have generally converged despite some dispersion. That basically is telling us to accumulate our wealth in a very aggressive manner. We should keep buying no matter the price and no matter the time. He uses an excellent example in his blog post. He actually says, why don't you search for the term stock market overvalued 20 2012 in Google and see what pops up. Many articles actually do pop up detailing what investors believed at the time, which was the market was overpriced by 50% in some cases. But now look at this graph of the S&P 500 as of this year. In 2012, it was trading at the 1400-ish levels. If you had believed it was overpriced back in 2012, you would have missed out on some serious gains for the past 10 years. I mean, the S&P 500 these days is close to three times what the overpriced values were back in 2012. My main takeaway way here is that there are so many different ways to build wealth. If your goal is between something between one and $5 million of investable assets, it's very possible for you to get there just by increasing your income, decreasing your expenses and investing consistently and regularly over a long period of time. If you wanna reach the 10 to 20 million asset mark, your time basically can't be directly correlated with how much you make. You need to build something with equity or something of value in order to get a bigger payoff so that you can get into that 10 million echelon and up. I myself have been thinking of different ways that I could probably do that one day and I'm really still not too sure of how to do that. But as I find out more, I will make some more videos about that journey. Don't forget to check out Webull for six to 12 free stocks whenever you make a deposit and that will be linked down below. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna leave a relevant video like right here for you guys, or maybe even right here, but it'll be my zero to 100K video in a year. If you really like this video, you'll probably enjoy that one as well. So thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.